happy Wednesday to everyone. We are going to get started in a few minutes here. We're just going to double check and make sure everything is live and working properly as it should on both Facebook and YouTube. Uh, we're streaming from three places this morning for the Museums from Your Home live stream. We'll be on the Gorgas House Museum's Facebook page, which it looks like we are live and good to go there. Uh, we're also going to be live on the Mildred Westervelt Warner Transportation Museum's Facebook page, which it looks like we are live as well there and doing great. And uh, we should be live on the UA Museum's YouTube channel, which you can find at youtube.com slash UA Museums. Looks like we are live there now. So uh, I guess we can go ahead and get started. So welcome to today's Museums from Your Home live stream presented by the University of Alabama Museums. My name is Rebecca Johnson and I am the communication specialist for UA Museums. And joining me today are Catherine Edge, the director of the Mildred Westervelt Warner Transportation Museum and Brandon Thompson, director of the Gorgas House Museum. Uh, welcome, uh, Catherine and Brandon, and uh, good morning to you. Good, good morning. morning. Thanks for having us back. All right. Well, before we uh, get started this morning, I uh, just want to remind everybody that we're uh, on Facebook and YouTube. So this is all live. So hang in there in case uh, we have any issues. Uh, hopefully that will not happen, but it is live. So anything can happen. Um, and also, if you're watching and you have any questions uh, for uh, Brandon about the Gorgas House Museum, or if, any, or if we can answer any of your questions, if any of us can, uh, feel free to drop those uh, questions or comments in the comment section and we will be able to see them. All right, so now that we've gotten some of that business out of the way, uh, Brandon, I believe you're gonna uh, take us through the Gorgas House Museum and the archeology span aspects related to the house. So uh, how should we get started today? Uh, yeah, that's exactly it. I am going to give everybody a presentation. I've done it about twice now to different groups talking about archaeology, what it is, uh, how it relates to anthropology, and then transition into what archaeology means to the Gorgas House. Because you know my background being anthropology and archaeology, that's really how I interpret and really see the educational aspects of the Gorgas House. And I'm also excited for Catherine to be here because Catherine's background uh, her degrees uh, also being anthropology. Uh, so it's good to have her perspective as well. And I'm really looking forward to her uh, kind of picking my brain as we go throughout this. So um, yeah, that's just a precursor. There's gonna be a PowerPoint presentation in a few minutes, in just a second, and uh, we'll get started. But please ask me questions, uh, pick my brain. Uh, usually when I do this in front of a live crowd and they have a, they can be pretty animated. So I'm excited to see what people ask this morning. All right, we've got the uh, PowerPoint up. So uh, whenever you're ready. Okay, I will bring it up and get started. All right, everybody. So yes, this morning we're going to talk about archaeology and the Gorgas House Museum. That is that. Uh, there's my content information down below. So at any point, uh, even after this presentation, if you have questions, feel free to send me an email. Go to the website or our social media platforms and pick my brain. So without further ado, let's get started. All right. So in general, what is archaeology? And its definition in generally is the study of the human past through material remains, basically those objects that people leave behind, with the aim of ordering and describing the events of the past and explaining their meaning. Archaeologists are interested in the origins of cultures, the way societies develop over time, and the relationship between the past and the present. So as archaeologists, we want to know about people and how they lived in the past. And I'm pretty sure some of my other colleagues over the past uh, couple of months have kind of delved into this a little bit. I know Lindsay Gordon uh, down in Malville has talked about archaeology. And we'll touch on some of the things she's probably mentioned a little bit. It's also, also in collaboration uh, in the talks with the Office of Archaeological Research, where I used to work. So some of this might be a review in certain extents, but this is going to see how we can apply this to a historic space, a historic house museum. So let's get going. So what are archaeologists' objectives? What is it that we want to do? So number one is to preserve and to learn about the past. That is at its core. We want to learn about people in the past. The origins of human beings. What human, where humans come from? What does it mean to be human? The origins of specific cultures. And keep an eye, keep uh, your mind wrapped around the concept of culture, because it is at the heart of what archaeology is and what anthropology is. And I think we touched on it briefly last week with Dr. Beeler talking about sociocultural history. And that's a pretty pretty prominent emerging field as well. So keep an eye on that. Uh, as archaeologists, we want to observe change through time. We want to understand how culture changes, how society changes, based on how the material culture that people leave behind, not only the small artifacts we look at, but also the landscape and how that changes. So that's something we're going to touch on today as well. Um, we also want to know about the relationship between the past and the present. How do things come to be how they currently are? 
and how do those change through time? And to understand ourselves, we must understand our past. And that is key, not only in history, but also archaeology and a few other few other things as well. So, uh, Catherine, you got anything to add before we keep going? I was just um, I was just going to say, and you know, the your last point about understanding ourselves, we we need, must understand our past. Very very relevant topic right now with everything um, everything going on. So, a lot of discussion, um, a lot of discussion about how you know, how history can, um, can and should impact, um, how we, how we act in the present and then, uh, set us up for a hopeful benefit for the future. So, um, so yeah, that, uh, that last point I think is, um, is very, is, is very relevant, um, in a very broad sense with so many things that are happening, you know, happening in society right now. So I, I like, and I, I like how succinct you put it, you know, to understand ourselves, we must understand our past. And I, I think, I think that's something that we, we all need to uh, remember and um, try to implement in some capacity. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Uh, history and archaeology, they allow us to view the past in context and really understand how these changes happened and understand how we are now. And, and you're absolutely right. That is something I would stress to anybody. These fields place in the context our pasts and place in the context our current present. And what does that mean? And archaeology and history help put those things in perspective. So absolutely. Okay, we'll keep going. So what do archaeologists find? <laughs> uh, by, by and large, one of the, some of the more amazing things people find, you know, we have the Malville site, we have Keokia, but we archaeologists find amazing things like Otzi. And Otzi was an Ice Age man uh, found in 1991 uh, in the Austrian Alps, between Austria and Italy. And he dates to about 5,300 years ago. And it is a pretty incredible find. So we can find things like that that teach us about the life ways of how people used to live. And, you know, things are always constantly found. Uh, so while we might, might have found Otzi back in 1991, we're still learning things about him today. Uh, recently, just read an article uh, that came out a couple of years ago. They've mapped all 60, 65 tattoos that this man had uh, from 5,300 years ago. And really? some of them map over, yeah, some of them map over current acupuncture points. Uh, so he was found with his clothes, some tools. They found cheese on him. Um, what's also interesting is that it looks like he was murdered. It's one of the oldest forensic cold cases we can we can think of. Um, so I. I yeah, yeah, it's it's really neat, you know, being the forensic bio art person that I am. Um, it's it's fascinating to think there's this 5,300 year old cold case, and we're still trying to solve it. So we know how he was killed. Uh, we don't exactly know why yet, and uh, that's some of the more interesting mm -hmm. questions. So you know, archaeologists, we find these amazing things like Otzi. I encourage anybody to go by and uh, take a take a look at it. So what else do archaeologists find? And this is really the nitty gritty. This is where most of the work comes in. But we also find archaeological remains that represent more mundane or everyday activities. And these are what we're really interested in. So on the left picture, you have projectile points that have changed through time. Uh, on the top right, you have ceramics, really pottery that people made. And those change through time based on their temper and the decorative motifs and the symbolism that they, uh, that they have. So really, in North America, you have fiber tempered pottery that's uh, made with like straw as the tempering agent that goes way back thousands of years ago. And then that transition to, say, things like bone, uh, broken up pieces of other pottery, sand, and then shell for like the Mississippian period. So it, it changes, it changes. And we can navigate and we can see those changes through time. And that's really what we're really interested in. And then at the bottom, you'll see some historic artifacts, things that you'll probably notice that are in your grandmother's kitchen or were in your great grandmother's kitchen. So uh, old bottles, broken pieces of plates, cutlery. And those are things we're interested in too, because it's really those everyday objects that really give us the information we're looking for when we're trying to understand people. So how is archeology span related to anthropology? So anthropology is the study of human beings, both as biological organisms and as culture bearing creatures. And their anthropology is a holistic discipline, which means that it encompasses several other disciplines and approaches to understanding its core principles. So there's biological uh, anthropology, which really studies the physical being of a person. There's archaeology, which we've been talking about, which studies the human past, the cultural remains that are left behind. Linguistic, uh, archaeo linguistic anthropology, which really studies language and how that's changed and adapted and evolved through time. And then cultural anthropology, which really studies present people today and their culture. And there, there's considerable overlap in these four disciplines, but really these are the four primary ones. 
And my background is biological and archaeological. And Catherine, I think yours is archaeological too, right? Um, well, I guess I I might, you know, I'm I'm kind of mm, I'd. I practiced archaeology, but I only practiced archaeology in my my field school, uh, which okay. took, which took place down at Mountville. It was a required course, and I enjoyed it. And I have practiced. Um, you and I actually practiced archaeology together in uh, North Alabama within the past mm -hmm. um, couple of years at a at a site. So I'm, I I I know how to do it, but um, after um, particularly after field school, I kind of thought this this is really cool but i don't think this is what i want to do all day every day as my as my career and so um i made um i kind of well i i got into anthropology because i liked i liked the holistic aspect of it i liked that it was you know, it was it was a little bit of science. It was a little bit of um, history. It was a little bit of math. It was a little bit of kind of everything together that I I felt I could do was interesting, and um, you know, um, the math that I was doing, you know, statistics. I was like, I can work some basic percentages. That's totally fine. <laughs> you know, the uh, yeah. you know the osteology aspect. I was very into anatomy and uh, and all whenever I was younger. So I, I appreciated that. Like I, I liked that it was a little bit of everything that was mm. all nicely wrapped together in this um, field known as anthropology and uh, thoroughly enjoyed linguistics as well. But going to, um, but developing a foundation in anthropology to then move into museums, I, I would almost kind of, I don't know if you can be a general anthropologist, um, mm -hmm. But that, uh, I guess out of out of the four main main things, I I would probably go a little bit more cultural because I feel like okay. that like history kind of fits a little bit better more in the the cultural um, mm -hmm. anthropology. But uh, I'm I'm not an anthropologist that is going to you know places like. I'm not going out to, you know, small islands off the coast of South America that have had very little contact with the modern world and studying those ancient tribal cultures. Mm -hmm. There are people that do that, uh, but that, you know, that's that's not necessarily what, um, you know, what what I would define as, um, you know, a, you know, cultural anthropology for myself. But um, but that's one of the reasons I liked anthro was because it it was so. Um, all encompassing and so hol holistic and um, provided a lot of, you know, provided a lot of opportunity and a lot of um, varied interest. Um, so that, um, you know, that I, I think I would describe myself a little bit more, more uh, contemporary cultural anthropologist. Is that, okay. a, is that okay. a term I can, sure. yeah, we'll uh, go with it. I can give myself <laughs> a title I can give yeah. myself. Um, yeah. But, but you're right. Like I, I have, um, I have a, a little bit of experience in every single component of, um, you know, the, the different components that make up anthropology. So, um, but that's one of the reasons that I, that I like it so much. So highly recommend yeah. it to anybody who's not really sure what they want to do. And they kind of have a, you know, a lot of, a, they're interested in a lot of things, but don't mm. maybe want to get, um, you know, uh, pigeonholed into just, you know, one, you know, one concentration or, you know, one, one, I told you I was having a rough morning. I'm absolutely. I'm, I get it. I'm, right I'm at a you. loss for words here, but, yeah, um, yeah. but that's uh, one of the reasons I liked Anthro is that it, it was it it had a mixture of all the things that I liked, and um, I'm not the best person at math. I readily admit to that, but there was just enough basic math that I could do it and knew knew my answers and my results were were accurate. You know, things like that. So highly yeah, recommend makes, it to anybody that's interested. Yeah, I think uh, I think a consistent theme you've touched on it, that's emerged over these past few weeks and months that we've been talking is that there are many many ways to get into museum studies or anthropology or history. There's no one one specific linear way. There there are you can take those, but it isn't necessarily required. You can get into these different fields that consistently overlap. Uh, so yeah, our background being anthropology, and then really specify from there really our specializations. Yeah. But yeah, I, I absolutely encourage anybody to do because it. Once again, it provides you provides you that perspective and places things in context. So yeah, right on. Okay. So here's the big issue. Uh, so the big term we talked about, so what is culture? It is the concept of culture that unites all of the subfields of anthropology. There are two basic definitions. 
One is a particular or unique system of individual human society. So think the Choctaw, the Creek, uh, the American, the British, all these little things that we can identify as that is a cultural group. That's what we're talking about. And then number two is that complex whole, which includes knowledge, belief, art, morals, law, custom, and any other capabilities and habits acquired as a member of society. So when you think of a cultural group, say Southern culture, you might think, barbecue and sweet tea and crepe myrtles. And that's really a Southern identity. I mean, that is how you can kind of coalesce the idea of what is cultural. And there's some overlaps there and it's really major, uh, kind of like regionally defined, uh, but with things such as the internet and technological developments, culture can really spread out and expand. And it's really the sharing of those ideas is what we're really getting on here. So culture is not innate. It is learned. And one of my former professors many, many years ago, I think he's still in the department, is culture is what you need to function in society. So language is culture. Your behaviors are culture. Your traditions are culture. Your music is culture. These are all the things that you learned. So if you were to drop me off, say, in Japan, I don't know the language. I'm not going to be able to function in that society. I might know how to order sushi. But that's about as far as I can get. And so once again, you know, like food is culture. So these ideas are cultural. And so what I would really want people to take away from this concept is what you really need to function in that society. And that's its most basic definition. But that, that, that's what I would encourage people to take away. All right. So archaeology. So more specifically, an archaeology is the study, study of the human past through its material remains. And archaeologists work all over the world and even underwater. And these are some of the excavations at the bottom of the Nile River. And I believe they're excavating, uh, I can't tell you exactly which Egyptian dynasty this is, but it's a ship down in the Nile River, which is, which is a fascinating excavation. And Florida is really famous for this. And then even down uh, with the Clotilla down in South Alabama, that's going to be a pretty major draw and something they're still working on now. I think it was the last slave ship uh, coming to the United States. So, yeah, I mean, underwater archaeology is is a, it is part of the discipline, and it's a fascinating thing to study. But Florida, uh, the University of West Florida, have a great underwater archaeology program. So check that one out. Okay. Now, archaeology can also be misused. And what are some of these misuses? So pseudo-archaeology is the use of real or imagined archaeological evidence to justify non-scientific accounts about the past. And we're going to show you some examples in just a little bit. And then the other big thing is looting or looters. It's the act of plundering archaeological sites to find artifacts of commercial value, at the same time destroying the evidence that archaeologists rely on to understand the past. And I have a quiz anecdote I'm going to give everybody in just a little bit. But these are two concepts we're going to talk about. All right, so examples of pseudo-archaeology. So these, these are the Nazca lines down in Peru that date to about 500 BP to about 500 AD. Um, for there's a pseudo archaeological explanation for why these giant geoglyphs exist uh, over the landform because they're really big. Are they aliens? The aliens do this, which is a really popular pseudo archaeological thing. Aliens didn't do it. Uh, were uh, the indigenous people using hot air balloons to be able to draw and to teach people where to go? That's not the case either. That's fun to think about. It makes a great story, but that's not accurate. But no. So these are large gifts created for astrological and religious purposes and. Archaeologists have worked and even found like early forms of transits. So if you're ever driving down the highway and you see these total station crews with this device and they're shooting lines and there's this guy way out in the distance holding up a stick and they're shooting a laser beam at it to map the terrain, that's kind of what they were using here. Uh, granted, they didn't have lasers or GPS systems, uh, but it was really someone holding this thing, looking out, kind of directing people exactly where they were going to uh, use these things. And the ancient Egyptians used a similar method when they were constructing the pyramids. So, no, uh, no aliens. Aliens is a fun and fantastic answer, but it's never the right answer. All right. So what's another example? Uh, I love looking at Google Earth as much as the next uh, geek when they want to study the map. I was looking at Iceland yesterday just because I wanted to. <laughs> uh, and if you go out into the ocean and you can see these lines, people saw these lines in this big grid system and thought, oh, that's got to be Atlantis. There's the evidence of it right there. But no, it isn't that fantastical. Uh, these are just sonar signatures off the boats. So the boats are going through the ocean and they're sending these sonar signals down to the bottom. They're bouncing off the bottom and they're hitting the boat again. So what you're really seeing is this grid system going across the ocean where, the, where these signatures bouncing off the bottom of the boat. That's all it is. And then again, this is about, I think, about a 50 square mile block. So it's a little too big uh, to be a city. So once again, uh, more logical answers probably aren't as fantastic or fun, but 
they're just as interesting in my opinion. Okay. Just as a fun little tidbit, um, about, yeah. because my because I I I have a I have a short haircut. When I use the right amount of really really strong hairspray and mousse and things like that, I can make my hair stand up like the guy on Ancient Aliens. That's always talking about aliens. Yeah, that yes. guy. Yeah. Aliens. Yes, I can. Um, you know, I can make my I can actually make my hair stand up the way that his does. I don't do it very often, but I I have I have the capabilities just. As a as a little fun fact, um, uh, yeah, that's a, that's a fun <laughs> and entertaining show. I haven't been able to get through uh, many of them. Yeah, um, so yeah, it, it's entertainment, uh, but it's 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 not accurate. And I'm sure there's some experts out there who would love to, to talk about this. And uh, no, uh, there's there's a, there's better people to debate you on that on that case. But yeah, it's it's pseudo archaeology. It's not it's not real pseudoscience. Yeah, it's yeah. and I just I just want to um, clarify for um, anybody the your image of the uh, the Inca the big Inca glyphs that yeah. is actually you know you can see this you know fantastic image of the spider here that is taken that is an aerial view. Um, mm -hmm. that is, you know, that, that's not an image on the, you know, zoomed in on the side of a piece, you know, of a pot or a plate or anything like that. Like that is an aerial view. I can't even imagine how many hundreds of feet up in the air. Um, but that just gives, uh, you know, if you're not familiar with these, um, they are, they are absolutely massive and really the only way to really appreciate the shape and the, the size and the scale is, is basically from an airplane. And um, I imagine that's, um, or, you know, we have drone uh, capabilities mm -hmm. now, which means you don't have to be in an airplane in order to get the, that aerial view. But that is, um, you know, that that is a, that's a massive image on the ground that, um it can really only be appreciated in its entirety from from an aerial perspective, and so I just wanted to, I just wanted to make sure that everybody was, um, if if you're not familiar with the again with the Nazca lines, um, you know that that's that's that perspective because uh, it it's so intricate and it's so exact. It looks like it could be on the side of a, a piece of pottery, mm -hmm. um, but it it is not. It is uh, it's yeah. out in the middle of um, out in the middle of a the the plains i guess if you will of uh, of peru so it's yeah it's uh, yeah these bone of aerial images i wish i had a scale on here and i don't uh you know these pseudo archaeological or pseudo cultural explanations for how things came to be i mean uh, another example would be i know stacked pyramids that you can find like mayan aztec cities then you also find them in southeast asia and then even in the middle east people point well that must have been aliens teaching everybody how to I don't really to, build, build and direct stuff. these things. Yeah. Um, but uh, it's really, well, one, people are people. And that's probably just the, one of the best ways to stack rocks and have them last for a long time. Um, yeah. And that's probably a simpler explanation. Um, so, yeah, we it looks like a, we've got. Yeah, go yeah, ahead, Kathy. I, like, I, 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 I honestly didn't know if you could see it, but we have a comment from uh, Ronald Howard. He says, my favorite is the face on the surface of Mars. Uh, yeah, that's a really and, famous one. Uh, yeah, <laughs> there it is. Yeah, there it is. It. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. Yeah, it's like humans. We are we're wired to look out for familiar things, and we're wired to look for faces because mm -hmm. those are people, and we want to identify with other people. So when you see somebody like that, I'm like, oh, that must have been this giant geoglyph dedicated to a face. I'm like, no, humans biologically we're wired to look for other people and other faces. Uh, but yeah, that's a fun image. Once again, it's, it's a fantastic thing. It, it probably spurned lots of imagination, a lot of creative ideas. Uh, but really, the more uh, plausible and logical explanations to me are ultimately the more fun ones. Um, but yeah, Ron, thanks so much. That that was that, that's a really good example. I appreciate that. Have you ever uh, seen um, the and and there there's a term for it, and I don't I don't know what the term is but it's basically uh looking for human faces human expressions in non uh you know in non-human objects like for example mm -hmm. you know seeing a face in a rock and things like that right. i my personal favorite is the uh the the two-pronged door hanger that is on um that's in a lot of you know public restrooms and things like that and because the oh screws, yeah the screws are a little yeah. off center it's you know somebody yeah. said something about you know angry octopus is ready to fight or something because it does yeah, the, I have, like a, i've got some angry octopuses octopus. right over there uh, <laughs> i love so, those yeah. i absolutely yeah. love those but yeah rebecca's pulled up a g bunch of great examples of yeah. um uh, oh the know, buttons are great i love the buttons 
that's yeah. yeah those are those are fun but yeah, yeah my, my the, favorite is the octopus because i see him everywhere and i'm just like you know I oh, the, oh God, yeah the sad <laughs> fountain that's really that's really the, yeah, yeah i mean there, there is a term for what you're talking about and i and i'm not a psychologist or, I know, you know, I so i can't really I tell you what it is, is. Uh, but yeah we're people right? that's that's really all we are uh, that, that's more fun okay <laughs> thank see. you ronald that was lovely <laughs> yeah yeah that was great thanks ron i appreciate that Okay, so getting to the other misuses of archaeology, and this is looting. So looting of archaeological sites is an international problem. And this photo shows items recovered by the FBI. Um, and once again, this, this is people going to archaeological sites and digging things up or stealing them and then selling them for commercial value. And a little closer to home, we have examples of this. So looting at Malville, and I know I think Lindsay talked about this a couple of weeks ago on the Malville uh, live stream. But in the 1980s, there were 264 pottery vessels were stolen from the curation facility at Malvo Archaeological Park. And it was a really big deal. Uh, the FBI was involved. And once again, these things are priceless. We don't attach monetary value to these things. It's really the information that we're most interested in. But, you know, thankfully, I think Lindsay talked about this. In 2018, three of the vessels were recovered in pristine condition. And uh, we know all three of these people uh, on the far left as uh, retired. Uh, professor of Archaeology, Dr. James Knight. In the middle is Dr. Alex Benitez, who's the director of Malvo Archaeological Park. And on the far right is Dr. John Abbott, the director of research and collections here at the university. So thankfully, these objects were able to were able to be recovered. And something that I learned in school, and something uh, is a little bit of an anecdote I teach people when they come to the Gorgas, we're talking about the items that we're interested in. Um, so imagine you're walking through the desert, you know, you've got is your backpack and some water and your little rock hammer. A rock hammer is basically a hammer with a little pick on one end. Um, and yeah, thank you for the link. If you want to learn more about that, please visit that link. So imagine you're on the desert, you've got your backpack, your water bottle, and your rock hammer, just doing a little uh, hiking. And you come across this amazing pottery vessel uh, that is thousands of years old. It's priceless. Uh, it, the amount of information we get from it to tell us about these people is unlimited. We're going to learn a lot about these people. But over the hill coming at you is this band of bandits, and they sell things on the black market. They're going to kill you, and they're going to take that vessel, and they're going to sell it, and that information is going to be lost. So the question is, what do you do? What do you do in that circumstance? And the answer to this question is you take your rock hammer, and you smash that pottery vessel into dozens of pieces. Because then it loses its monetary value to the bandits. They're not going to want to take it and sell it. They're not going to kill you because it doesn't mean anything to them. But you as an archaeologist, you are interested in the information that vessel can give you, not in the vessel itself. And that's something I want people to remember. Yeah, granted, these items, these artifacts are important and we should preserve them. We should curate them. But it's really the information that as archaeologists and anthropologists that we're most interested and concerned with. So I would take that away for anybody. Okay, moving on. So the importance of archaeology. So to kind of wrap up, archaeology is the study of the human past through its material remains, really those physical objects left behind by people, but also how they change the landscape, uh, like the Nazca Lines or even the Malville uh, Native American mounds. Uh, it is to study the past. Archaeologists have developed specific methods by which we discover, recover, preserve, describe, and analyze these remains. So if you've ever watched National Geographic or Discovery Channel and you see these giant square grid block excavations that look beautiful, these nice clean walls, there are reasons those things are done, and it's really for control. We excavate in tiny little increments so we can control exactly what we're looking at as we go down. There's a lot of paperwork, and unfortunately, there's a good bit of math and geometry involved when we actually start doing all this. Uh, but there are reasons for all that, and it gives us control while we collect these data, and it's really important. And finally, ultimately, theory provides the means to interpret archaeological evidence and allows for description, explanation, and understanding of the past. Because if we didn't have a theoretical understanding of what we're looking at, a theoretical lens or framework to guide us, we're just looking at things that we've dug up. So, I mean, there's, and then archaeological theory is an entire lecture on its own, but there's processual archaeology where you think you can look at things objectively. There's post-processual where you try to understand that we're looking at these things as people in a current context as opposed to their past ones. There's even Marxist archaeology where you're trying to understand the social systems that were in place. There's a lot, uh, and if you go to grad school in anthropology archaeology, you get to learn all about them. Um, but yeah, there are a lot, and you'll get to write a paper or two about them too. Okay. I see that that's where you have you have more uh, specific um, specific knowledge and background because um, isn't isn't your master's in in anthropology and archaeology? Yes. 
Yeah, my master's yeah. in anthropology, uh, focusing in forensic anthropology and bioarchaeology, which is just a fancy way of saying I looked at the biology of archaeological sites um, and really human remains and what you can learn about people, their health, their diets, uh, what was going on within their trauma and all that. So that was really what, what my focus was. Uh, I, but yeah, I thought, yeah, I thought but, so. Um, but I, uh, but that that that's that's where you and I that's where you and I kind of di diverge a little bit because mm -hmm. yes, we both have backgrounds in anthropology, but you have a um, having a master's degree that is anthropologically focused that really really delves into um, those those specific topics. Um, I went the other way. My master's is in museum studies, so mm -hmm. I have so I was I was doing the same thing, but it was. Um, you know, it was focused in the museum environment and, um, you know, how, you know, how, how best can uh, museums, you know, educate and, you know, different things like that and um, aspects of curation and, you know, display and all, all that, all that kind of good stuff. So that, that's, that's where, that's where you and I, that's where you and I kind of di di diverge and you've got more, um, you've got a, a heavier theoretical background in anthropology, whereas I've got, um, you know, my, my anthropology was, I, I was an undergrad, you know, an mm -hmm. anthropologist, um, and have, uh, but has, has you, I've used that foundation to then, you know, carry on into, um, you know, down, down a different path. And yet mm -hmm. you and I are both now working in a museum and historic house yeah. environments that, uh, where we, where we use, uh, we use all of this on a, on a daily hourly basis. So, um, it, uh, it's, yeah. just, it's just one other great example of of how user friendly, um, how user friendly all of this can be. Yeah, um, you know, I enjoyed being out in the field doing archaeology for ten years. I got to work on some amazing archaeological sites that we'll take a look at in just a little bit, uh, and see some amazing landforms and landscapes and meeting some amazing people. Uh, but I'm really happy that now I'm in a climate controlled historic house museum instead of walking through the pine forest of Alabama in the middle of July in 90 degree humidity. I'm, I'm very thankful to have the air conditioning set at 68, 69 degrees and being able to walk over to the Ferguson Center to get Chick-fil-A when I want to as opposed to eating an apple and a cliff bar. Uh, <laughs> so I'm, I'm happy for the trajectory uh, my career has taken. Um, and then now also, you know, working on uh, both work, both of us working on our uh, our doctor degrees in mm -hmm. higher ed, we're learning all these theoretical applications that we can also apply to our museum spaces too. Um, so really just the philosophy of education, all this really just coalesces. So once again, all these fields can really build on top of one another that we can learn a lot about. And it's it's been a really fun ride so far. Absolutely. Okay. All right, so archaeologists are interested in how and why ancient cultures change over time. Here's a picture at 1A May 10. It's the Whitesburg, Whitesburg Bridge site in Madison County, Alabama. This site was taken, or this picture was taken in the late 1930s, early 1940s. Uh, it was a Native American site, a mound site. I believe it was a mound site. I have to go back. It's been a while since I've read that report. Uh, but these were excavations that went along the Tennessee River prior to it being dammed up for like during the, the TVA era. Um, so before they dammed up the river, they went and excavated dozens of sites to try and recover as much material as they could before it was lost and inundated uh, when they were flooded the river. So this is one image of what one of those excavations looks like. And you can see just how big that block excavations were. Uh, and if you can see the stakes kind of on the picture too, uh, you can see the grid system that they've laid out to organize everything. So each grid has a number uh, and letter designation once again, geometry comes into play. So if you like Battleship, playing the game Battleship, it kind of give you an idea of what that looks like. Okay, here's another picture of a more recent excavation. This is probably in the 1990s. Once again, these larger excavations. Here you can see archaeologists at work. Uh, you can see people shoving, shoveling, doing tiny, real thin slices on that, on the dirt. You can see just how thin they are. Uh, and then they're taking that in wheelbarrows and then taking it back to the shaker screens in the back. Uh, where you can actually sort through the soil and keep everything in, in context. And there's a lot of paperwork. All these bags have labels, and it's very, very important. So I show you this picture of archaeologists at work. So you can see a picture of an archaeologist not at work. And this is <laughs> me uh, in Malville. I'm working on some Mount P excavations, and I think this was back in 2012. Um, I think we are coming to the end of the excavations, and that's what it looked like. Uh, I guess I've been working that hard that day because I'm relatively clean in that picture, uh, but that's an archaeologist not at work. Uh, I would say if if you're on, if you're if you're wrapping up, you are unusually tidy. But I'm very um, clean there. Again, just just to give everybody a little point of reference, how tall are you, Brandon? Six foot? 
Uh, six, I'm about six, two? six, what about six one, six two. Yeah, about six one, six two, something like that. Okay, and if if everyone will notice that um, that feature that he's standing in is deeper than he is tall, so that is just an a, a, yeah an yeah. example so, of how much detailed work and you can just see how beautiful that that striation behind you is just absolutely beautiful um yeah so yeah each slice is uh, a layer in time and you can go down in each of those and as you go deeper there's a lot something called the law of superposition so basically it just means younger things are on top and older things are on the bottom and you actually see us working down on top of it uh, but yeah that's the Nat geo Nat geo photo we were taking but yeah i think that's those are the malpi excavations and that's like eight years ago man i look a little different I, I was going to say, I don't um, think you look any different at all. So congratulations. Oh, you think so? Oh, okay. Okay. There's more hair under that hat than there is on my head right now. Uh, wow. I know that's for sure. Yeah. All right. All right. But yeah. All right. Moving on. So how does archaeology differ from history? So we're getting closer to this connection with history. So history works with written accounts and oral traditions about the past. Written history often emphasizes the royal and priestly elite. We touched on this a little bit uh, last week, Dr. Beeler, how history is really kind of moving away um, from that from that perspective. So archaeology works with the material remains of the past. Archaeology is less partial to the rich or learned folk, the great man of history perspective. Because you're looking at historical records, you have to think about, well, who was writing these histories? And for what purpose were they writing them? And who were they writing them for? So it's traditionally white male educated people, depending on where you're working, uh, where you're actually working uh, uh, in the world. And that can change depending on where you are. But really, history has these historic documents, and that's what they're interested in. Well, archaeology, we'll look at anybody's trash. If you throw it out in your backyard, we'll find it in 500 years. We're going to talk about it. So that's really where archaeology has its strength. So then there are two types of archaeology. There's prehistoric versus historic archaeology. And even this, this terminology is really uh, kind of coming under scrutiny now in terms of how we actually use this. But historic archaeology is archaeology that is combined with the analysis of written records, both oral history, which are spoken accounts, and documentary history, which focuses on those societies with writing or utilize. And prehistoric archaeology is interested in societies and time periods that lack written records. So historic archaeology, at least in the southeast, started when the Spanish explorers came through, DeSoto came through in like the 1540s, mm -hmm. they actually started writing about what they were experiencing. And that's when historic archaeology begins in the southeast. Anything before that is considered prehistoric archaeology because there wasn't necessarily a written record. We have symbolisms and motifs and imagery on pottery and different things, uh, but it's not what we would call uh, traditional language in the sense. So that's really how those two are divided up. All right. So an historic site, and Catherine will recognize this one. So if anybody who was in Tuscaloosa about seven years ago uh, remembers when uh, this is the Bank of the State site at the corner of Greensboro and University Avenue, NBC Suites Hotel is now standing here. Uh, this is me standing on a really tall platform, even on top of a bulldozer, and I'm taking a picture looking southeast. You can see the bank building over to the side. Uh, but yeah, this is what a historic site can look like. Uh, and it's downtown, it's an urban area, industrial archaeology looks like this. So yeah, this is an example of a historic site, really about 1819 all the way to the present moment because the site continued to be used. Uh, but really that's what we were founding art artifacts and objects for. And we'll show you some pictures of what this looks like. So historic site, now what does it look like? Um, so on the left picture, that is a feature that's been bisected to see the profile view of a pit where the Phoenix cabinet manufactory was. So you're actually looking at hardware and tools that were used by a cabinet maker from about 1820 something all the way to the end of the cabinet shop, really like the 1870 period. Um, and at the bottom, you see all these different examples of different types of glass that we recovered from the site. Some of them going back to the 18th century, all the way up into the middle of the 20th century. And Catherine, do you want to tell everybody a little bit about the uh, the Crowley's jug? I I mean I certainly can. Um, yeah. So the the I was not um, immediately involved with the um, the excavation of the the Bank of the State site, but um, because we just celebrated our um, our bicentennial, uh, not only for the state of Alabama but also for the city of Tuscaloosa, um, Brandon and I worked together to. Um, uh, develop a, um, and our staffs, you know, work together, uh, to develop a, a 
centennial exhibit. And we wanted to, we chose to, to look at the Bank of the State site because it started in, um, it started in 1819 when uh, the, the founding year that, that Tuscaloosa, uh, that we were celebrating as uh, when Tuscaloosa started and went all the way up. These excavations were done in 2013, if I'm not mistaken. Is that right, Brandon? Yeah. yeah. Um, so for the, for what we were going to investigate, this site was absolutely perfect because it was one of the first inhabited blocks within downtown Tuscaloosa and conveniently was um, located uh, close enough to both of our um, current locations that it, um, it, it felt more relevant. So, um, so we developed an entire two-part series that, that was all based on information, both archeo archeological and historical, that was all based on this uh, Bank of the State site. And the Crolius jug in particular was, uh, was our featured artifact, if you will, on the, uh, the first exhibit that was focused on the capital period um, because Tuscaloosa was the capital from 1826 to 1846. So we were basically looking, we expanded that a little bit and um, basically looked at 1819 through the 1850s. And the Crolius jug was a very, a, a really, really great find. And we were excited to be able to showcase it because the Crolius family um, was actually based up in the, Manhattan area of uh, New York and had a kiln up there where they created created pottery and um, the when excavations were taking place up in New York a number a good number of years ago where they found the uh, the remains of this kiln and all these examples of Crolius pottery that the the family had created and and all that were left over um, it was an absolutely fantastic um, find in terms of information and, you know, gave a really, really great example of what Manhattan looked like in the, um, you know, during, I, I believe, the, you know, the early 18th century. Mm -hmm. And all of that material was stored at the, um, stored within the, the Twin Towers. And we all are very aware of what happened to the Twin Towers. And, um when those two buildings were destroyed, all of that material was destroyed as well. So all of the the evidence from those excavations that took place up in in the Manhattan area uh, were were lost. They they are gone. There's no getting them back. But the fact that we have a Crolius jug here and that was that was brought down to our area and was. Um, you know, we we don't know we don't know why it was discarded. Maybe maybe it broke. Um, mm -hmm. It was maybe it was replaced. You know that that part we don't know, but we have enough of it to to reassemble together. That was found on this site. That um, not only not only is is incredible because Crolius jugs are now a a rare artifact to have, but we were able to link it again through our being able to research the, the, the history of the jug, we were able to link it to the transportation aspect, which was um, important for our specific museum location because we look at history through the lens of transportation. And so we were then able to discuss, um, you know, well, how did the Crolius jug get down here and present, um, present the opportunity for visitors to think about how how would you move in uh, in the 18 in the 1820s and the 1830s basically moving from an urban center that was um you know Manhattan area New York down to basically the wilderness that was um Alabama at the time and um so being able to utilize that one artifact in all those different capacities was was absolutely fantastic. I personally love the Crolius jug, and um, I think the story behind it is really, really, really interesting. Um, but that's that's one way that we at the Transportation Museum use that artifact to not only talk about history, but then also talk about transportation and um, and how it how it all related to Tuscaloosa and how it connected Tuscaloosa to Manhattan in the um, eight. 1920s, 1830s. Um, so that that was uh, that was a really really great that, that's a really great artifact, and I'm um, I'm really excited that I actually just got to see a picture of it again because we, <laughs> we enjoyed having it, and it's a it's a great piece. Yeah, it has it has a fascinating history, and like you said, I, I was happy uh, that you know you were able to share this piece with everybody and talk about its history, and it's fascinating to think 
Tuscaloosa has this national connection mm -hmm. with his family. That was an, um, an immigrant family that came to New York and started setting this up. Uh, so it's fascinating to think about how it made it all its way down here and really being connected to those international and even national trade networks. So yeah, it, it's a fascinating story. It's a fascinating piece. Okay, so a prehistoric site. Uh, if anybody is from Tuscaloosa, this might look familiar. Uh, this is Malvo. This is Mal P behind the Jones Archaeological Museum. Uh, this picture was taken during those 2012 excavations where you saw me standing uh, relatively clean underneath that tarp. So what do you find? What are you looking for here? So on the top left, you can actually see some of uh, the Office of Archaeological Research uh, workers, but also some students. Uh, we did this in collaboration with the University of Alabama's Department of Anthropology Archaeological Field School. So it was an opportunity to give uh, students a chance to work with professionals, uh, both in uh, an academic setting and a cultural resources management perspective, which was, it was a really fun excavation. And some of the things we found, if you look at the top right image, uh, those are remnants of ceramic and stone discs and discoidals. Uh, the little one with an X is really a gaming piece. And the others, I think, are a pallet fragment. Uh, and then on the, on the left side of that picture, you'll see a bone awl, which is the smaller bone tool. And the, love, and the other one we think was either a knife or a dagger or some type of chisel. Uh, yeah, once again, yeah, thank you for sharing that link. If you wanna learn more about those excavations, uh, please check that one out. Uh, and then uh, that bottom image is a picture. Once again, one of those images of these block excavations going down into the mound. And all of this was done uh, in preparation for the walkway going up to the, the back staircase of Mount P. And it's a beautiful vista. If you're uh, able to check that out whenever you can, please do so whenever the park opens back up. All right, so how does all this relate to the Gorgas House Museum? We've gone through this entire journey of archeology span and anthropology and historic archeology span and prehistoric archeology. span what does that mean for the Gorgas House Museum? What does that mean for a historic setting? All right, so real quick background, just to get everybody up to speed. So the Gorgas House built in 1829 is the oldest building on the University of uh, Alabama's main campus in Tuscaloosa. It is the only building from that original design plan that still stands, it still exists. And it's one of only four primary buildings. I say primary because there may have been some secondary buildings that also survived. But one of four primary buildings survived the burning of the campus during the Civil War. Uh, the others being the Presence Mansion, the little round building next to the library, and then Maxwell Hall, uh, pointing over my shoulder because that's the way I point when I give the tour in the in the building. Uh, that's really to the west of the Gorgas House, and it was the observatory at the time. And that entire lecture could take uh, another two hours, but for the sake of brevity, I'm going to keep moving on. So uh, the Gorgas House was originally built and designed as a student dining hall. That was its function. Uh, it was remodeled as a residence uh, in the 1840s, but it continued to serve other things at the dining hall, including a uh, hospital and later hotel and a lecture space. And then it served as the residence for the Gorgas family from 1879 until 1953. So just quickly, who are the Gorgases? All right, so these are the three prominent members of the family. I'm just gonna to touch on them really quickly. So on the far left is Josiah Gorgas. Um, he was originally from Pennsylvania, served in the US military for 20 years. At the start of the Civil War, he resigned and joined the Confederacy and became his chief of ordnance for the entire Confederate army. Uh, after the war, he did a few little things. I'm not gonna to touch on them much, but there's an archeological connection there, which was a fun excavation. Uh, but in 1879, he became the eighth president of the university. But within a year, he suffered a stroke and had to step down from the, those duties and became a librarian. Now in the middle, that's Amelia Gail Gorgas. Uh, they were married, she's originally from Alabama. Uh, they were married, they had six children. When she got to university, she became the university's postmistress, nurse matron, and when her husband was too sick to be the librarian, she took that job too. So she really kind of reshaped and redefined the role of women on campus. She's a really interesting person to study. And then on the far right is their oldest son. They had six children, but William is the most internationally famous Gorgas. He was in the military, but really the long and short of it is that he is credited with eliminating and abating malaria and yellow fever in the Panama Canal Zone and getting the thing completed. Uh, and I could go into a lot of detail about that. He would on become the Surgeon General of the U.S. Army. I uh, was given an honorary knighthood when he was in London shortly before his death. Pretty interesting person to study about, but there were five other children that lived in the house at some point in their history and their lives. So that is just a real, really a bridge, quick deep dive into the Gorgas family and they're part of the Gorgas house. All right. So the archaeology of the Gorgas House. In 1999, the university's Office of Archaeological Research excavated several test units around the home. Now, they were looking and trying to gather information on the layout of the ground surrounding the home 
including garden plots and outbuildings. They want to know exactly what the disposition of anything around the home actually was. And let me show you a picture of people working back in 1999. So this is out in front of a home. This is, you're looking west. Uh, that brick wall is no longer there. I want to say that was taken down between 2000 and 2005. Uh, and when everything was kind of remodeled around it to look more historically accurate, at least when the white picket fence was put up. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, you can see how archaeologists are working. They have these little text, uh, little test unit excavations, scooping up dirt, throwing it in the screen, then shifting it. And uh, I think that person in the way back might be a colleague of mine who's still down there. Hey, Smitty, if you're, still, if you're still down there. All right, so once again, so this is what the map looks like. Uh, the top is north and the bottom is south. You can see all these grid blocks. So something that they did was use ground penetrating radar to give them a, give those, them idea of where they could actually excavate. And ground penetrating radar is just that. It sends radar beams into the ground to give them an idea of what's in the soil. Uh, the first Jurassic Park had something similar to this where they put like a shotgun cartridge in a machine and they shot these sonar beams down to the ground to see the picture of the velociraptor. It's not that cool. Uh, it doesn't quite look like that. Uh, you really just drag these things across the ground or walk back and forth to see what you can look look at. And then if you look at the tiny black squares that say like TU6, TU4, those are test unit excavations. Uh, and you can actually see where those where they actually look like. So what did they find? Well, uh, on one corner of the house, they found butchering pits. It was a dining hall and just behind the home uh, was a two-story brick kitchen where slaves lived who actually prepared the food and meal. They found butchering pits filled with uh, pig and cow bones. They're trying to feed people, and this is an up, and this is a glimpse into one of those feeding episodes. So what else did they find? All right, so I mentioned the kitchen behind the house. This is at the corner of Morgan Hall, uh, just behind the home. And if you see that line of stones and the darker coloration of the soil, Morgan Hall was built on top where that kitchen was. But all that material is still there. And they were able to find portions of where that kitchen was. And when we had our, uh, I guess, our, our live stream with Dr. Clay Nelson, we talked about this a little bit because he did his one of his student internship projects on this excavation. All right, so some historic artifacts. They found ceramics, container glass, gun flits, buttons, coins, things you might expect to find uh, in a 19th century um, occupational site. And it's also an early 20th century site. And these are some of those things that they found. All right, so what does this mean? So what do you do when you blend all of this? So they found prehistoric and historic artifacts. So by and large, it was a historic site, but they did find some uh, Native American pottery that I think dates to about a thousand years ago. I think it was Bulberry Creek pottery. And if Clay's watching, he could tell me exactly what it was. But we actually have some of these artifacts displayed in the house now. So you can actually go by and take a look at it whenever we open back up. So historic artifacts, they reflect the domestic and kitchen activity, typical of a dining hall, a residential area. And they many utilitarian and functional pieces. So once again, this is somebody's home. It was a dining hall. It was a hotel. You're looking at domestic and everyday living activities. And you're not finding artifacts that you might associate with the elite. You're finding artifacts that you would associate with everyday people living. So while, say, the Gorgas family or other people around campus might be trying to emulate certain types of behavior that they would consider elite, they're not living that way at least socioeconomically. It's not reflected in the material culture. And that tells us something about them, which I think is a fascinating perspective. So we're coming down to it. So I'm gonna kind of close up real quick. So what are some of the current and future projects based on all that? Well, we have a student exhibit and Dr. Nelson talked about his exhibit and what we were able to actually find there. And the kitchen excavations recovered that blue bead. And we're 99% sure that blue bead was owned by a slave. So we were able to contribute and talk about the history and role of slavery on campus at this small excavation that happened 20, 21 years ago. And something else we're potentially working on is a possible historic garden recreation. What do these historic gardens look like? When we did the Bank of the State site uh, downtown, and we had uh, some scientists from the University of Tennessee look at some of the soil samples we had, some of those feature samples, they could actually tell us the kinds of plants that they were using. And I think the most fascinating one that sticks out in my mind is they found a lot of passion flower seeds. Passion flower can be taken and used for jams and jellies. Uh, so those things. So this this, the archaeology and historic space can really help guide future exhibits, future content creation, and really place into context and help reinterpret the historic space in which you're working. So 
that is really it. Uh, I want to thank everybody for watching and paying attention and asking questions and whatnot. And Catherine, thanks so much for your comments. But really, archaeology in these historic spaces helps us direct future content efforts, helps us with our interpretation, and really provides a holistic understanding of the people we're trying to study. So while we might talk about the Gorgas family at the Gorgas house, and certainly they were there for basically a 70-year period of history, there's a lot of other activity going on at this place. Uh, the home existed for 50 years before they got there, and it's since existed for 70 years since uh, the last descendant died and passed away who was living there. Uh, so we have all these different periods of history that we can talk about, and archaeology can help us do that. Uh, and I think that's one of its strengths when you actually look at it at, in a historic space. Um, but yeah, thank you so much. Uh, Catherine, do you, do you have anything to add? No, I think, um, no, I think uh, you were... You were afraid you weren't gonna. You you were afraid you weren't gonna fill the hour, and you are right yeah. right on the hour. So kudos kudos there. Um, but I think <laughs> I think um, the the perspective that you bring from your um, archaeology background and everything that you know and have practiced yourself within um, archaeology is is really going to take the house to uh, to another level, and. Um, and again, well, continue to make it absolutely, and continue to make it um, continue to make it re relevant because um, I, I think that's something that uh, museums and historic houses are, are are shifting into, and that the um, maybe not that they're shifting into, but the the community and public perception is that it you know they're I think they're the community is starting to feel a little bit more uh, comfortable. Um, coming into, you know, coming into our, our spaces. Um, sometimes a museum can be a little intimidating. Sometimes a historic house can be a little intimidating. And um, having, having this background information and talking about these, these stories that have not um, been, been discussed on, on the regular, have not been discussed in a, in a open format, um, really, really breaks down any barriers. And, um, and I think that's, I think that's incredibly important. Um, maybe, um, uh, very important for historic houses, but I think all, all museums and institutions of the like can, can benefit from that. And I think I, I'm very positive that that is a direction, a positive direction that in which we're moving. So, um, the, the yeah. perspective that, that you bring to it is, um, it, is great and um just again just kind of reinforces that history opens the avenues to discuss other histories and uh that's that's what that's what museums and historic houses are intended to do is have those conversations and um present historic facts to inspire inquiry and um, yeah. and I think yeah, yeah I think that's our I think that's our goal at the end of the day. So yeah, you, you're absolutely right. A, a criticism of historic houses, and it's a valid one, is that often the material inside, the way it's presented, doesn't reflect how people lived. Mm -hmm. It is like this romanticized, idealized version of how we like to think about it. And I think it does a disservice to the people you're studying, and it does a disservice to all the other stories and histories that we want to talk about. So when people walk into the space, I want them to see it. Yeah, people lived here. And I can see them walking that way and spilling their food dinner plate all over the floor. And that's a part of the history we can actually talk about. Because it's those individual human activities that are so interesting and so fascinating. Um, so yeah, we, we definitely have that opportunity. But no, thank, thank you so much for the kind words. I really appreciate it. Oh, great. Again, great, great presentation. I always enjoy hearing, uh, hearing about the... The Gorgas House and your background and how the two combine and um, just you know it it's inspiring as I sit here and look over the my 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 empty museum but you know COVID so we need to be conscious of that it it's sure. very inspiring to um, you know again just continue continue the work and continue um, again present the facts and inspire inquiry and I think um, I think that's at the end of the day, I think that's that's all we can do. But um, you do you do a great job at the the Gorgas House, and you know I'm we're always happy to collaborate down here at Transportation. So anytime you want well, to work you. on something, you just let me know. Well, likewise, likewise. Yeah, I'm always so fascinated by how history is uh, still being learned. 
you know, we, we haven't reached the end of it. There's always something new to discover. So I think that's what's really cool about um, what you all have done, uh, both at the Gorgas House Museum and at the Transportation Museum. So thank you for sharing that presentation with us today, Brandon. Really appreciated that. All right. Well, I think that's uh, going to wrap it up for this Museums from Your Home live stream. We've changed our live stream schedule a little bit. We were Monday through Friday, but we're changing things around to make uh, room for some big virtual online summer events that we have uh, coming up. Uh, the most recent one, if I can get my handy dandy little banner here, is uh, Bama Bug Fest, which is going to be uh, starting next week. So you can head over to BamaBugFest.org to check out some of that. I know the Transportation Museum is going to be involved with that. That's going to be a lot of fun. Spider-Man's going to be there. Black Widow's going to be there. Uh, we've got some uh, beekeeping things. Uh, I think there's some chocolate chirp cookies that are going to be made. Uh, so there's a lot of fun uh, stuff going on for Bama Bug Fest this year, even though we can't uh, meet in person down at the Transportation Museum uh, due to COVID-19. We're still going to bring the bugs to everybody online. So definitely go check that out. If you would like to support any of the uh, programs or any of the educational stuff that we do with UA Museums, you can go to give.ua.edu slash museums and become a supporting member of UA Museums. That's a great way to support us. Uh, if you want to keep uh, in touch with the video content, uh, I know we referenced some of the other live streams and some of the other video content that we've done in relation to the topic of the Gorgas House Museum as well as archaeology, you can go to youtube.com slash UA Museums and subscribe to our channel and that will give you notifications when we go live or when new videos come up. So that's a great way uh, to keep in touch with us there. Uh, one more website just to point you to is the Museums from Your Home website. You can go to museums.ua.edu slash museums from your home if you're curious about any of the online activities that we've got going on and uh, in any of the past archived live streams that we've we've done uh, over the last couple of months, you can find all of the information there. Well, I think that's uh, going to do it for us. So I uh, just want to thank everybody who watched today and everybody who's going to watch in the future for visiting UA Museums from your home. All right. Well, hope everybody has a happy Wednesday. All right. Thanks, everyone. Appreciate it.